Today's topic is about black men and mental health. So we can start. We can start right oh, there with seeking therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. Well. I could. Well, oh, you know, do your little intro. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, I usually just begin it with, you know, happy Monday. Welcome to Tisha on the Tube. Um, it's been to have Monday, so I hope everybody's Monday is going wonderfully. And Put first off, before we get into it, yeah. Shout Normally I'm a little darker, but you know, I'm going to be a little light for today. That's for fishbowl. We ain't doing fishbowl, though. Right, that's why I said I'm a little lighter. So anyway, how are you doing? Those of you out there and you too, Broski, how are you doing on this lovely Monday? I'm doing fine. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yes. <laughs> I felt like it made a lot of sense to have you on here because you are like one guy, like consistent in my life that I speak to like daily or whatever and you had like really good insight so i felt like it made more sense to have you on as opposed to me just sitting here talking about black mental health for men and all of that right. you're a man so you understand the plight you understand Sometimes. the struggle of what you know what black men are going through right. so who better to have than you <laughs> and this could more than likely encourage other black men to like speak up and be vocal about mental health and about like their own um situations and experiences or whatever so i might not be talking as much in this segment i'm i'm more than likely have you have the like let you know. <laughs> nah, nah, we're not about to do that <laughs> no i'm not saying i'm not going to talk a lot i'm or like say anything in general i'm just saying like i want to allow you to have the floor so you can say everything that you said to me earlier because it was right. really good like notes like i wouldn't have even known how to talk about that because i'm a female i could talk from a female's point of view but i can't speak for a man because although we share the same you know like plight as far as being black in general yes. being a black male and a black female in this country completely different yes so i mean i will ask you a couple of questions though pertaining to black women and black men together but right now i want to focus on black men and mental health because it seems to be frowned upon and it seems to be a thing where society has it so where men cannot be fragile they can't be vulnerable they can't be you y'all just can't y'all gotta always hold it down and be right you know the providers and always got to be strong but when do y'all find when do y'all have time to cry when do y'all have time to feel when do y'all have time to do anything so Oof. um yeah uh kind of like how, how you said it it's for me, I can be honest with this. I mean, a lot of guys are probably going to go and that, that could be the problem right there and be like, oh, nah, you know, we don't feel that way. But, you know, it starts even before we get to the black, uh, before we say black men, thing, you know, for all guys, it kind of starts off really young. Um, once you hit about a certain age, you know, something happens and the response is man up. You know, it's like, up to let's say five six you can fall and scrape your knee and run to mommy and you know if it, if you cry then she's like they're there you know i'm gonna make it feel better da, 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 da. you know same action you make it to 10 years old and let's just say i'm not saying that that's like i'm just dropping numbers here you make it to 10 it's like all right enough now get over it man up right a lot of the things that i feel like is that we've come to deal with is get over it you know it's don't focus on it just it's not something you deal with and this is a conversation that you and i have had a lot um especially last year last year i was going through something and i told you you know my very specific response to you was oh don't worry about it i'll get over it you know like it's pretty much something that you're taught from young like from everybody um your shit sorry my cat Rolled up. <laughs> right. Don't you hate that? <laughs> I 
was like, <laughs> what is cool, that on my so leg? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like you're told, get over it. it. Starts off with family, you know. Then you get older, and it starts being like with friends that you're expected to act a certain way. Then you know you get into relationships, and then it's like they're, you're expected to do stuff there. And you know, it's you have society telling you all of these things. So now that's just how it is like as a guy now being as a black guy it comes with its own special set of rules so you know all guys they kind of have these rules imposed on them but then black guys have their own special set of rules imposed on them that our white counterparts do not or any other um race for that matter but just black people have their own rules um the conversation that you and i had and i'm kind of jumping around but it all relates to it is um you know you had to sit well i think you were going to i don't know if you actually did you had to sit mj down and nyla down and have that conversation with them about uh you know what happens if you get stopped by the cops you know and being a black person this is the type of conversation that you get and being a black boy black kid black whatever it's probably not the same conversation a white parent has i don't even know if white people even talk to their kids about what to do if they get stopped by the cops. You know, maybe they'll just very quickly, very briefly, like, you know, maybe say, don't start any problems. I don't know. You know, we, we all have that joke where, you know, they start going off and I'm a taxpayer and I pay your dollars and da, 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 da. But you know, the, the typical white person, I'll say, I'll give them benefit of the doubt. And they're kind of like, look, just stay calm and be, you know, don't act up. And then that's probably it. As a black person, I never had that talk with my parents, but I always knew like, you keep your hands on the steering wheel. You know, you get stopped by the cops. You don't make any sudden movements. You don't do nothing to make them feel any type of way. I've been stopped by the cops three times. You were with me when it happened. <laughs> once. Yeah, that was um, like nerve-breaking because we had a child in the car. Exactly. And the thing is, a lot of people, they get stopped by the cops and, you know, they're just like, oh, and it's more of a... a more of an annoyance it's more of like a a distraction like oh my gosh it's terrifying being a black person being stopped by the cops um that night we got stopped by the cops i was in a turning lane <laughs> but that's only because the way i was supposed to be i was supposed to turn but i didn't want to turn so i kept going straight it's a violation yes but it's nothing major it's a, a simple thing the type of thing that if you get stopped, if you get off with a warning or maybe even a citation of sorts, depending on what kind of cop stops you. From the moment I kept going straight, I saw when they turned, they were, they were um, off to the side. I saw when they turned their lights on and they came after us. And I told, to every, I told everyone in the car, like, oh, snap, the cops are coming. Now, I felt like I had to warn everybody about that from jump, you know, just let them know. And I'm like, and I pretty much knew that they were coming for us. It's a scary process to go through because you don't know how it's going to end. You hear the news and you hear all of these things and you wonder to yourself, is this, am I going to become a statistic? Am I going to be the reason why something bad happens? How is this going to turn out? What's going to happen next? And this is something that can really affect you mentally. Like you don't know for something as simple as, because I didn't make the turn like I was supposed to, is this going to lead to me losing my life? Right. And that's a very scary process. That's a very scary thing to think of. And it, those were all questions that definitely were going through my mind as y'all in the car with me. Now, the thing is, you have to stay calm. You have to remain that pillar of strength. I mean, it was I was the only guy in the car. It was you... It was one other lady and it was her child. I'm going to give out names just in case. And I was like the only guy in there. So already, we were all black also. Already, I have to be that person. Who, I have to emanate that calm. I, I can't freak out because, you know, who are y'all going to look to? Because supposedly that's how it goes. Y'all are looking to me to be that, that pillar of calmness i have like not saying that y'all do but y'all were looking to me for that calm like if i if i can remain calm then y'all will somehow remain calm as well and if i if, you know if for whatever reason i start freaking out then who knows how y'all are gonna act so i have to you know automatically be like okay i have to stay calm for the sake of them i also have to stay calm not to freak this cop out 
Now, luckily, it was just, uh, I don't remember if it was a white cop or, or black cop. or whatnot. It was two of them, of course. You know, one of them comes to the window, the other one does the creepy thing where he comes off to the side and he but looks. I, I remember the one that was in the back was like, he was like some type of like Asian Filipino. He looked a little bit. Yes. He and I think the one that was by you, he looked like to be Indian or something like that. Something off of that, that right. kind of like. But they I don't, I, too- honestly, I don't remember. If it goes well, I kind of just push out. Like I said, I've had a couple of them. I've had a couple of them. A lot of them are for different, a lot of stupid reasons. I've been stopped because my tail light, uh, my headlight hasn't worked. That that was once where it was twice in one night. The same cop stopped me. Right. And they do the, they do this. Like I said, they do this weird shit. One of them comes up to your window, and then the, their partner comes up to the side. And I remember I was talking to him, and I heard like a weird tapping on the glass. And I look, and it's his partner like looking into my backseat with his flashlight. Um, it was like it was early in the morning because I had to drive my dad to work and he's like it was like 5 a.m so the sun hadn't come up yet he's like peering into the back and you know like I said you don't know what the hell's gonna happen 5 a.m nobody's on the streets these people pretty much get away whatever the hell they want to do what am I gonna what am I gonna do in the process like this so yes back to when it was just us um I have to stay calm for him I have to stay calm for y'all and it's just like I was stressed as shit. <laughs> like, I was terrified. I was terrified for me, and I was terrified for y'all. Not so much what would happen to y'all, but just terrified that, oh, my gosh, y'all are in this car. If something happens to me and y'all witness it, that would be my fault. So I felt bad because um, I'm going to say his name, Philando Castile. You know, he was in the car. He was in the right. He had his... I think it was girlfriend and his kid in the back. That did not stop them from doing what they did. So legit, I, I'm not gonna say I was thinking of him specifically in that moment, but I was thinking of the situation. If they're going to do something, them being in the car is not gonna stop them. Right. And God forbid something happens. And you know, even if it's me, somebody else gets hurt as a factor of it. It it went well. And like I said, you know, y'all are in the car and I kind of like, you know, I stayed calm and they, they let me off with a warning. Don't do that again. Da, 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 da. Next time, take the turning, take the turn and then find the long way around or whatnot. And, you know, I brushed it off with y'all. I stayed calm. I stayed whatever. Inside, if I'm being completely honest, I let out the biggest sigh of relief. Right. I, I was just so happy that it turned out to just be nothing more than just a warning or whatever right. it was. Because and fortunately and unfortunately, it was a teachable moment for her as a child, even though it's sad that we had to even sit and explain how to operate or whatever right. when it comes to that. Because children, until a certain age, children are led to believe that the law is to protect and serve us and that the police are actually the good guys or whatever. But and, you know, there are some good guys. I'm not saying that everybody that's a part of law enforcement is a bad guy or a bad girl. There are some people who are trying to change the face of the justice system. Yeah. But it's just that. And it's a needed thing. Like, everybody's like, defund the police does not mean remove all cops. At least when I say that is not what I mean. We need, we need a system of law and order. We need there to be something in place that should somebody do wrong. There is an organization set there to try to rectify the situation. That's that's all that is. The problem in, in is fairness. I'm, it has to be it. fair. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. It's unfair. It's an unfair system. It's not. It's it's not. You know, people. Okay, a certain color of people, they get the harsher sentences versus the other color of people who get off of probation or warnings or citations or just a little, you know, a little, a little thing on their record or whatever. But we're getting harsh sentences. We're getting our asses beat in prison and all of that. And then we're coming out of the prison system, freaking destroyed PTSD, all kinds of stuff. So it's like, it has to be an unfair, I mean, it has to be a fair, like, it has to be a yeah. justice system. But the, it's not just that system. Everything is pretty much rigged against us in the sense like oh, yeah. you keep hearing the things like um, the amount of black men that go to jail, the 
how the black on black crime stuff you hear about um black fathers supposedly being an anomaly and them abandoning their family my whole thing is i'm gonna say this now and I'm, I'm glad I get a chance to say this on the thing. All of that can affect a person, like, even subconsciously, even if it's not, you know, something that they actively act on. I'm not going to say it's not real, but it is completely bloated and blown out of proportion. Let us be honest, people. Every race kills within their own race. If you go to a predominantly white area, all the crime that happens there will be done by white people. So... That will be white on white crime. If you go to a predominantly Asian area, all the crime that happens there will be will be done by Asian people. So that is Asian on Asian crime. Any area that has black on black crime will be an area that is predominantly black, where it's black people committing the crime. That's that's just the only way it works. So to say that black on black crime is a thing is to also accept that white on white crime is a thing, Asian on Asian whatever you want to call it, any area you go to, if you look at the demographic and that is the majority of the people there, that is the majority of the people committing the crimes to other people of their kind. If I go to China, guess what their statistics are going to be? Oh my gosh, Asians must hate other Asians for killing each other like that. Like, it just doesn't make sense. You're blowing it out of proportion because you're trying to deflect from the greater system and say, oh, well, we're not going to respect them until they stop, until they start respecting themselves. That's one. Two, black men, black people, black fathers, it's not that they don't leave any more than other fathers do. They really don't. Like, there are sciences, statistics, there are facts out there showing the disparity that the, the media makes it look like, movies, the news, whatever, of the <laughs> black man abandoning his family is not that much compared when it's the other people. People... Well, this is shitty, but people leave their families. Men leave their families. No much more so than a black man. Now, yes, black men do get sent to jail disproportionately than everybody else. We know this. But once again, still, if you take it in the large scope of things, the majority of black men and black people are not in jail. It's just the amount that gets sent to jail is disproportionate for the type that do the crime and compared to everyone else. But overall, most Black people are not in jail. Most Black people are le leading healthy, fulfilling, non-crime committing lives. All of this, however, though, subconsciously has to grate on you to the point where, as a man, as a woman, as a person, it, it has effects on you. It makes you see things differently. It makes you act differently. As a black man, <laughs> there are certain situations I would never allow myself to be in, especially if I'm like, you know, I'm I'm not a thug guy. Let's be honest. I'm I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not hood. You know, I'm hood adjacent. I know stuff. <laughs> They're right. not gonna catch me because I know automatically just being there should the wrong person show up, that's it for me. That's it. This can mean many a things. If I'm, if the police show up, automatically, oh, he's a suspicious character. You know, should someone who feel any type of way, I mean, just anyone in general, they come up somewhere and a black person is there who typically wouldn't be, you're not going to catch me walking around in a white neighborhood just for the sake of it. Even if it's a nice day, I'd rather walk around the long way, drive through certain areas, whatever, like you become any place, you just stick out and you're a suspicious character and it's just... It doesn't make sense and it's not fair, but this is just the world that we live in. Okay, we got all the black stuff in. Now, <laughs> let's to get to the mental health part. Because of all of this, you would think, you know, you would try to find people to talk to. Now, we probably do talk to others about it if, you know, you allow yourself to feel that. I mentioned before, um, most guys have been taught to get over it. Personally, I'm the type who I, I always like just bottle it up. And I told you this, you know, you hate that I say this, but it's true, y'all. I am the type who will bottle things up and she tells me all the time it's not healthy. And I, I know it. And I told her, it's fine. I'll just keep bottling it up, bottling it up, bottling it up. One day, somebody's going to scuff my sneakers and I'm going to end up killing them. Now, 
it's a joke and it's funny but it's also very not funny it's funny in the sense like okay yes we both know i'm exaggerating and i don't mean it but we also know that i say this and it's a possibility it could actually happen i know you're not supposed to bottle things up like that i know you're not supposed to like suppress how you feel i know it's not healthy but it's how i've been taught and how i've always learned to cope who do i talk to who am i supposed to go to with this stuff it's never been made clear to i mean it's been made clear but this is as i've been growing up as a kid it was you don't talk about this stuff you know you're sad get over it oh you have a problem deal with it it's never let's walk through this or it's never been here let's discuss this how can we fix it how can we whatever that's never been a thing and then when you watch movies and you see people who go to therapy that's always been oh that's a white thing you know that's always been oh that's you know you have to have money to do that but even if you have money to do that let's say you see a black person why are they going to therapy that's that's the white people shit like it's always been that's the white people shit we all know y'all Stuff that we don't want to do or that we don't like doing, nah, that's the white people shit. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that if you don't want to do it, you can just easily play it off by saying that's that's some white shit right there. Now, granted, there are some that's stuff that's some white shit. Like you just no, that ain't that ain't the way. But talking to somebody shouldn't be that case. I don't know if I could find a personally go to a therapist. <laughs> she just tried to tell me I should get one. She thinks I need one. But, you know, like I said, there's that stigma to it also. You go to a therapist, there must be something wrong with you. It has to be, oh, it's not just you talking through the things that you're getting, but you have to, and I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to say anyone is, but you, you're you crazy. There's something wrong with you, and you're crazy. Unfortunately, that's just the stigma that I was I was raised to believe. Nowadays, everyone knows that's not the case. I'm, well, everyone should know that's not the case. But it's not something you can get rid of so easily. Like deep down, I know, well, I am a little, but I know I'm not crazy. We all are, we're all jacked up in some way. It's just, <laughs> are you gonna deal with it? Or are you gonna, are you just gonna sit there and just dwell on it? Or are you gonna actually do something about it? I do, I bottle it up. I told you this, I bottle it up. Like That's not healthy. Says you, but I cope. I manage. I've become a relatively sane being for this however many thirty years of life I've been here. Right, like. For now, you do know you don't <laughs> get younger. You get older, right? Trust me, as the years go on and you bottle it up, it's gonna keep coming back to bite you in the ass. I'm and I told you, you, it hasn't done it yet, but it will. And I told you, when that happens, I'm just gonna explode the one time we've had this conversation many times. That makes no. I'm going to explode the one time, my bottle will be empty, and then it's going to take years again for it to fill up. So I'm good. What, this this gives me like, let's say two, three good explosions in my life until then. I'm I'm good. So last year I was going through some... You're in denial and not the river in Egypt, but I'm going <laughs> to let you rock. Right? I was going through some really rough shit last year. And we've had this conversation many times since then. There's even a... Uh, uh, a fishbowl episode where we talked about depression. And I don't know if y'all can see this, but I was like this close to breaking down. Like that shit hit really close to home. And I, me and Tisha spoke about it, have spoken about it since then. And I think I might've even mentioned it once uh, other time also on um, one of our fishbowl episodes. But just talking about it and being able to express certain things, it all, even, things that aren't relevant and yes this is why I say you're right you know it's all connected and I have to talk about it I don't feel comfortable going to a stranger and talking about my stuff I'd rather come to you and this and I remember in that episode I'm saying even if you don't talk to a stranger find someone you trust that you want to talk to I think the process of talking it out is helpful I don't know if I can go talk to somebody I don't know about it though most times yes I feel like I cope better by just suppressing my shit like you know what whatever and that's it like just whatever that's how i deal with most things that's how i've been raised to deal with most of that's how i've always dealt with stuff it's not 
right, I guess, so to say, but it works for me. And I mean, I guess this is, this makes me the perfect thing to talk about this because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of guys who are going to look at this and be like, yeah, you know, well, I do too. Like, yeah. You know, it's what works. And if I came on here and I'm like, oh, no, I just talk about all my stuff, guys are going to be like, oh, no, I can't relate to him. There's going to be a couple who probably still say no, but it's easier not to have to deal with that shit. Like, you put it, you put it in a box, you put the box, you shelve it up with the other boxes, and then you forget about it. It it really it it's that simple. It's that easy. That just is what it is. <laughs> Let me tell you the negative effects of bottling stuff up, and this is from my personal experience. You at some point will start getting very bad. Like your, your physical elements will start to get to you. I ended up in the hospital from bottling stuff up at the age of 17 because I felt like I couldn't talk to my mom. This was around the time where I was just like, I was rebellious my whole teenage years. The moment I hit puberty, I was rebellious because my mother felt like, um, I felt like my mother felt like she could shelter me from the world with religion. And it was a religion that I didn't even care or ask to be in. And this is why I feel the way that I do about religion now, because I feel like it's used to force people to do things that they don't necessarily want to do. Like, I feel like people don't use religion for good. You know, not to say that all religious people are like that just to say people use religion as a crutch for the to for the they use it as an excuse to do things like as validation to do things that they know they're not supposed to be doing so i don't remember it's kind of like foggy for me a little bit but i do remember that i was at school and the whole day, I just was not feeling good. I had a headache. My back was hurting. I think I had a fever. Like, I was jacked up. I actually got taken to the hospital, I think, in an ambulance or something. Yeah, I got taken in an ambulance and got to the hospital. And there was just so much going on. And it was all kinds of things that was said. It was said that I had an uh, uh, ectopic pregnancy and... <laughs> I had a sinus infection, all kinds of craziness. Like I spent the weekend in the hospital all because I suppressed everything. And my body was just like, nope, you're going in the hospital this weekend. And that was the worst weekend of my life. Like legit, I was even thinking about doing the whole wrapping my sheets, tying them in a, in a knot. <laughs> and escaping out the window type of thing, but I knew that was impossible. So after that weekend, I made the decision that I am never, ever, never going to suppress anything. Like, I'm not bottling nothing up. I'm going to tell you how I feel. I'm going to express myself. If you don't like it, then too bad. This is how I feel. Fast forward to two years ago, I was still suppressing certain things it almost cost me a friendship it almost cost me my life because that was the same week that i was like you know what i don't want this anymore i'm done i didn't care about nothing i didn't even care about my kids and that's how i knew i was over it when that thought came, because the first thing I think about with anything is my children. How does this affect my children? This day in particular, I was like, I don't care. And literally, I had just got done from dropping my son off at school. And I was like, you know what? Today's a great day to jump in front of the train. This was the thought in my head as I was walking back to the train station. And then when I got to the train station, I don't know what happened 
all I know is like something was just pull out your phone. That's what I did. I pulled out my phone and I played games on my phone. And next thing I know, I was home. So I had to go back to therapy. I had to, you know, start back at therapy. And I was like, okay, I got to get it together. I have to, I got to take care of my mental health. So I'm not saying that that's the same thing that can happen to you, but I'm saying suppressing it does nothing, but hide it for the moment, but it comes out somehow. For me, within the past couple of years, it's been coming, it's been coming through my dreams. It's been coming through, um, it's been coming out in therapy because I speak to my therapist about a lot of the things that's going on with me, but it's mostly mental since for like since last year it's been hitting me here and we both know what happened to me last year that jacked me up here and now i'm just like whoa so i'm a firm believer now and your mind controls what you do you really may think that you have the control but your mind controls everything because the fact that I couldn't control my movements and I was doing whatever my mind told me to do scared the hell out of me because I had no physical control over what I was doing. I wanted to stop. I wanted to sleep. I wanted to do all of that. But my, my mind was like, nope, let's get up and dance. Let's, let's do this. Let's do that. It was scary. So if it hasn't hit you yet, that's how it was going to hit you. And all I'm saying is, I'm not, you know, because therapy is not for everybody. Not everybody's comfortable doing therapy. That's fine. But you have to let it out in some way. Let it out and confide in people who you feel like you could confide in. Let it out in your web too, in your, um, in your comment. Let it out in any way that you can express yourself. Not necessarily therapy. Like I said, therapy is not for everybody. I mean, I encourage therapy for people who feel comfortable enough to do it. If you don't feel comfortable enough to do it, going to speak to somebody one-on-one -on -one isn't necessarily just the only form of therapy. You have music therapy, you have art therapy, you got meditation, you got yoga, you got any type of physical activity that, that helps relieve that stress. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to speak with somebody that you're not comfortable speaking with. Have it come out. You could tell it in your story. People can relate to you. In a comic, please, people can relate to you definitely if you put some type of story in your comic about what you're going through or whatever. People like relatable shit. I say that all the time. Hence why I do like the fish bowls and I do the mental health because, and I've, I've heard it said to me, like just recently, last week, one of my friends was like, you know, um, I really like watching your mental health Mondays because it, it really makes me feel like I'm not alone, especially with this whole COVID situation. I said, that's the whole point of me doing it. You know, I don't do it just for myself. I do it for everybody, anybody who can relate, you know? So I just, I just want us all to find our, just find, find, just find it, find Find something that's therapeutic. Doesn't have to necessarily mean going to see a psychiatrist or a therapist or anything. Find something that works for you that's therapeutic and healthy. Because we're, our race especially, are dying from ailments that are like crazy. Heart disease, diabetes, cancer, um, depression, anxiety. And it's getting swept under the rug. And it's not fair. So find something that releases that stress and allows you to let it go. Doesn't necessarily have to be talking one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. That's where I'm going with it. For me, therapy works for me, but also coloring works for me. Getting behind this camera works for me. Writing down, you know, affirmations and stuff, having visuals or whatever, because I love pictures. I love, I love butterflies. This is my favorite. This is the only bug I could tolerate. Any other bug could kiss my ass, but this is the only bug I could tolerate. Okay. And I just love like, I, that's, that's, that's an insectist. Yeah. I, but this is the only one, the only one, the only bug that I could tolerate. <laughs> what about ladybug? Ladybugs too. I love ladybugs. I don't, what is it about ladybugs and women? Women love ladybugs. For me, I don't know 
know about everybody else, but for me, ladybugs are like very personal to me because when I grew up, growing up at my grandmother's house, she always had like her windows open in like the spring and the summertime because my grandmother, she was a plant lady. She had plants all over her house. So she would always have her windows open and I think she has screens, but somehow ladybugs will always get in her kitchen and they like the light that she had in the kitchen. She had this little um, lamp sitting over the sink that she never cut off. And ladybugs will always go there and it would be different color ladybugs. It was, it was the first time I saw a green one, a yellow one. I never really saw a red one, but it was mostly green and yellow ones that will always be in her house. So for me, whenever I see a ladybug, you know, I like to think that's my grandmother letting me know she's okay. Like it's a symbol, it's a personal symbol for me of my grandmother. So I don't mess with ladybugs. Uh, the other day, a ladybug was on my son's bed and I didn't bother it or nothing. I just took it and I freed it outside. But ladybugs and butterflies, I, I love them. I have like a connection with both. So yeah. That's just, that's my thing. I don't know about everybody else. I know ladybugs are a symbol of luck. I'll take that. But me personally, for me, it's a personal thing. I like to think it's my grandmother and my aunt, whom they're both, they were sisters. So they, you know, I like to think that that's them just letting me know, hey, Tish, I'm okay. You know, that sort of thing. So that's my juju on that. Like that's, those are the only two that I could tolerate. Any other bug, I ain't messing with. <laughs> but yeah, so like that's that's my thing. Like just find something that's therapeutic and healthy for you to release that rather than you feel like, oh yeah, like you said, therapy, that's some white people shit. It's really not. It's really not. say that's some white people. I said that's what, you know. No, but I, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you in particular. I'm saying right. people in general. Society has it to where we can't have therapy, we can't go to therapists, we can't, no. Mental health services is for everybody. And that's why, and that's why I'm such a heavy advocate for it. And that's why I said, you know what? It's time for me to go to school. And it's time for me to learn more about psychology. Because I know, I know a little bit, like I said, I, I'm always psychologizing people. People just don't know it. But I'm always psychologizing people. It's a bad habit. Oh, he tries to do it to me too. I'm a, I'm a tough nut to crack though. I cracked you a long time ago. You just don't know. Wow. You just don't know it. You've been cracked already. You ain't that tough. Maybe to the wow. average person. Wow. I cracked you a long time ago. It's that like, ain't even true. It is true. I don't follow none of your advice. <laughs> You don't follow none of my advice, Okay, really? no, that's not true. That's not true. That's not exactly. Uh huh. And I do, I do come to you when I have a problem. Uh huh. But let's be real. You wish I, I listened more. You definitely. I do wish you listened more, but I'm not gonna like. I don't, I don't give advice for people to to, to feel like okay, you know, I don't give it to y'all to be like, well, you need, you better do this. Because it doesn't work that way. You take what I say and you do whatever you want with that information. Only thing I care about is planting the seed. That's it. That's all I care about. If you take it and you decide, I ain't gonna listen to her or oh, maybe she has. Right. So why you can't accept that I'm happy suppressing things? Because it's not healthy. And I'm not gonna <laughs> allow you to do stuff that's unhealthy. That's not gonna make me happy. If we're talking about mental health here, that's not healthy. <laughs> It might be healthy to you for the moment. It might be working for you for the moment, but it's short term leads to long term, you know. It's, yeah, short term unhealthiness leads to long term heart disease and cancer and shit. Okay, think listen, about that. Listen, all right. It right now. Look at me. I'm smiling. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Leaping. You know how many, do you know how you do it? All right, let's refer to my t-shirt appreciations. Let's refer to my mental health. Let's refer to a lot of videos that I have done where I'm smiling. I'm happy. 
I'm this, but deep down inside, I'm crying, I'm stressed, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. You know, the face of depression does not look sad, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 It's okay. Like I said, <laughs> you said you're a tough nut to crack. I cracked you already. Wow. Don't listen to her, people. Don't listen to that. It's not true. It's the truth. It's not true. It is the truth. Go ahead and front for these people on this here red app. I'm fronting? <laughs> yes. I'm not fronting. Uh-huh. I will say she is an amazing person to talk to. I will say she does care about my mental. I will say whatever. But I'm being legit when I say I'd rather not talk about it. And when I That's say... Fine. I'm the type of person. Okay, so when you were when you were talking about your mom and you know how that that worked out, I have a mother, y'all. Who <laughs> I love my mother dearly, I do. But I have told teachers about the things that my mother has done or the things that she has put me through. If most of us think about it, especially in the age range we're in now, our parents were toxic as fuck. Were and are. Were? Were, this. are, you know, it depends on you to the, how you want to view it. But the way we were brought up was toxic as fuck. We were taught you don't talk back to adults. You were taught that you stay in a child's place. And not to say that to some extent there isn't some truth in there. I understand some of the ideal behind it. But you know what? Nowadays, I don't believe you have to respect your elders. I feel like, and this is something that you were always said, that you're always taught that, you know, respect is something that is earned, not given. But, you know, as a kid, it's like, oh, well, you have to respect elders. It's just, it's just an automatic. No, if the person is disrespecting you, I don't believe you have to respect them. Um, You stay in a child's place. You know, there's certain conversations that aren't for you, but you know what? The same way right now, we live in a different time where we have to have different conversations to begin with. And a child's place telling a child, oh, well, you cannot know about this until when you feel, um, when I feel you're ready, doesn't make sense because everybody, it's relative. For example, the sex talk, when do you have that with a quote-unquote child? When are they ever ready to actually have that talk? Everyone comes at it differently. So staying in a child's place is a relative-ass term for just basically saying, I'm not comfortable having this conversation with you, so I'm not going to. (laughs) And that's that's all that is. A lot of of things that we were told as children was just things to tell us to shut up and you know shut up none of your business blah 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 stay in a child's place i don't tell my kids that because my children are they stay in their place my children are children i haven't had these difficult talks with them yet i think the most (laughs) difficult talk i've had with my son has been like a bullying a bullying talk i had with him and it kind of it didn't kind of break my heart it broke my heart that he just pretty much was like, you know, he just broke down. I didn't even know that he was feeling all this because my son is somebody that you got to pull, you know, you got to pull it from him because he doesn't really, he doesn't know how to deal with his emotions, which I understand because at that age, I was the same way. I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. And then when I did deal with my emotions, people were like, careful, oh, tease. Shut she might grow up to be me. Huh? I said, better be careful. You might grow up to be me. <laughs> he ain't gonna hell no, no, hell no, because you know Damn, my, my, like son that. Goes, my <laughs> son is going. My son is already in therapy. <laughs> Don't say it like that. Talking about hell no. I'm a great person. Okay. I'm not saying. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I know, I know, I'm saying I know, I know. as far as the suppression goes, I'm making sure he don't suppress nothing. I, am, I admit it. I'm very emotionally stunted. People, I can. Yeah. Admit. And that's fine because, unfortunately, like you said, how we were raised, it was toxic as fuck. But it was like that because how our parents were raised was toxic. So it's a generational curse, which is like why, unfortunately for us millennials, it's a lot of effing work, but we have to break those curses. We have to. It's a must. And I know me personally, I'm breaking that curse. I can't, I can't allow that. I can't, I check myself more as a mother than I ever have in my life. Like all the time. Like I always 
I always have days like there's been days where my kids will go to bed thinking that I'm the greatest mother in the world. And when they're in bed and I go in their room and I cut off the TV or I take a, I, I put their own um, tablets up or whatever to charge. And I'm literally saying to both of them, I'll do better tomorrow. Every mother has done something like that. Where it's like, we just have a day where we're just not feeling it. And we're just, we feel bad because we screamed at them for them asking for something so simple as a juice box or a snack or something like that. I've done that where I've said to them, I love you. I'll do better tomorrow. You know? So it's, it's a generational thing. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Never had that. But we we can't help. Doing a good job. My mom never apologizes. My mom never apologizes for anything. Always apologize. I have no problem. It, it liberates me. I say that all the time. Me saying sorry and me checking myself, it liberates me. I cannot, I can't walk around feeling like I'm wrong and strong. It doesn't feel right to me. In my heart of hearts, it does not feel right. It does not feel uh, that, right. You already I sound like a great mom in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, I try. I'm serious. My mother, yeah, I try. like I was saying, I never had that. Like my mom, my mom did not apologize. My mom was not the type of person I feel like my mom is. I'm sorry. I still not the type of person I feel like I can go to to talk to my stuff about. Like I've legit, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you too, I'm sure, where, you know, especially recently with certain things, I've tried. I will try to talk to her. And it's kind of just like, I don't think she means it in a type of way. And I don't think, you know, she intentionally does it. But, you know, you get the brush off and you get the, eh, you know, or whatever. And it's just like, you know, figure it out type stuff. And this is kind of why I just feel like if your own mother doesn't want to hear your stuff, why would other people? And I've told you, I don't want to be a burden. Who am, Like, I, if something's really weighing on me, then yes, I will come to you. I will tell you how I'm feeling, Teeth. But there's a lot of stuff also. <laughs> Like, I'm not telling you or anyone else. Or I'll tell, I'll tell one person this. I'll tell another person this. I'll tell another person that. And I'll tell, like, one more person that. If you have that many people to talk to, let's say. Just so it's like, okay, I can talk it out. But each person only gets a little bit of a certain situation. So it's like, they're not feeling overwhelmed. They're not feeling like I'm bringing them my problems. Because that is how I feel. Oh, I'm damn. I told her about two of my problems in like the past month. Shit, I'm definitely saying too much, and she's gonna feel like I'm a burden. Let me not do that. But see, Somebody that's another thing. We don't. We also have a hard time maintaining friendships because we think friendships is supposed to be all about, you know, going out, having fun. Real friendship comes with having those deep conversations about your friendship. It comes with, you know, having somebody to lean on or whatever. And you already know us and our friendship, me, you, you know, me, you, Lynette, Ashley, you know how we operate. Robin? Ashley, Robin, Rabinowitz, whatever you want to call us. <laughs> We all, you know how we operate. It's not a burden. I never feel burdened when my friends come to me with their issues. If anything, I feel comfortable knowing that. Okay, we all you feel like, feel like that when people come to us. Huh? Let's be honest. When you have to go to people, do you not feel that way? No, I do feel that way. Hence why. It's, I go to therapy too. It's just something that I don't know what it is. You could call it. I don't know what it is, but this, it's that voice in your head, though. Like, they don't want to hear this. Why are you burdening them, them with this? Like, why are you doing this to your friend? Like, you're going through this shit. They don't need to go through this shit. And like you said, I know, I know. You're, like I said, I know you're an amazing person. Teach. I tell you all the time. You have, like, you tell me you see auras, and that day when I came to you, just knew I was sad. I don't, I'm not going to, I don't see auras, but if I had to, you have a bright, sunny, yellow one. You are warm, you are kind, you're amazing. Like, I tell you, that picture that I love of you is the way you, you're wearing the yellow dress. I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound wrong. I don't want it to come out wrong, but you remind me of the sun in that picture. Like, you're just so warm, and 
it's it's amazing like i just that's my favorite picture of you like that is my very favorite picture of you and i know i know you have no problems with me coming to you but at the same hand me coming to you is a burden like i don't know how that makes sense but in my mind that is what it is i know you're gonna you're not gonna say it you're not gonna say you're never gonna say oh my gosh this is a burden but at the same time there's another part of me that's like damn why he's always coming to me with his problems like damn like i i know that's not you i i get it i do i do it's just i'm just just the wiring in there somehow that just makes it feel like that i get it but i know for a fact because of the kind of person that i am my purpose and i've known this for a while my purpose in life is to serve and be nurturing so my purpose in life is to leave a legacy and I want my legacy to always be that people feel comfortable coming to me about anything. That's my purpose in life. So it's never a burden for me. If anything, it fulfills the fuck out of me. It does. I feel great knowing that people could feel like they could confide in me about anything. That really makes, it, it makes my soul happy. It doesn't feel like a burden at all. It only feels like a burden if you come to me and you're like, all right, well, here's my problems. Take it. If you're like, okay, well, I have an issue. I just need some advice. I need somebody to talk to, blah, blah, blah. I don't feel like it's a burden. I just, it, it's a way, it's a way that people go about bringing stuff to me. I know when it's a burden. Believe me. I know when it's a burden. We feel like it's a burden then though. Like I just, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't know what's. I know when it's a burden. I'm telling you, I know when it's a burden. You coming to me like, all right, well, this is how I've been feeling, blah, blah, blah. That's not a burden to me. A burden is when you're handing your problems to me, when you're, when you're giving me your, your issues telling me what's going on with you or just letting it out or releasing it that's not a burden to me there's a big difference and like i said i know when it's a burden because i've grown up with stuff like that my entire life so i know the difference between a burden and someone who feels like they can confide in me i know the difference i don't ever feel like you're burdening me at all at all i don't feel that way about none of my friends Anybody that I'm cool with or that I I hold to a certain regard or whatever, or even if you're somebody that I've I've met in passing or met in groups and we haven't officially met in person or whatever, and you feel like you could come to me and talk to me, I don't feel like it's a burden. And I've had plenty of people do that. Like I've had plenty of people come to me about mental health Mondays. I've had plenty of people come to me to just talk and vent or whatever i don't feel like it's a burden i know when it's a burden i don't all my stuff feel like burdens anything that i have to bring anything that is of mine that i don't want to say doesn't affect you but it's like not directly correlated to you like this is my problem and i'm therefore bringing it to you and telling it to you is going to be a burden because you know what if I didn't say anything, you wouldn't have known anything. Your life would have kept going on. Now I tell you this, not to say that it's going to make you sad or it's anything, but now, I, <laughs> look. I get what you're saying, but at the same time, your program, like you said earlier, your program to just get over it, to just man up, to just deal with it. I'm not programmed that way, not anymore, because I made a decision at 17 that I was no longer going to shut up and be quiet. And then I made that decision again at, how the hell old was I? 30? That again, I'm going to stop putting band-aids on bullet wounds. So it doesn't feel like a burden to me. It's not a burden to me. You may feel like that because of how you were, how you grew up, which I understand. I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. The bleeding, I, I feel like a band-aid on the bullet. <laughs> this is so bad. 
You said what? If it stops the bleeding, let's say it's not a very bloody bullet wound. You know, you just slap that sucker on, you know. Nah. Nah, not what I went through two years ago. That was that was that was legit almost hit an artery. That wasn't a graze. Right. So yeah. And I was just putting a band-aid on it and going on with life like da 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 da. And it wasn't helping. I mean, I don't want to say I want to go through something like that, but I mean, mine are working. You know, I just slap it on. Just not, not a bandy, but like more like the the the, square, the big square ones, just uh, like the nicotine patch looking ones. You put that on, yeah. it's, no. it's there. You know, it's doing a good job. It's keeping me together. You know. Now, don't get me wrong. The one thing I would admit to people who are listening, who are watching, I know I'm broken, y'all. Um, we, we all have cracks, right? We all have our cracks. We all have our stuff. I know. I <laughs> the crazy part is I know I'm barely holding on. Like every time there's a crack, like just imagine a glass bottle, like a shattered glass bottle, and then somebody like rearranges it. They put it back together, but they're not using glue or anything like that. They're kind of just like using string. So it's a very like tenuous hold. Like you know, like just any little piece falls, the whole thing is coming down. There are times I feel like that. There are very much so times I feel like that. And I know that's not okay. I do. But at the same time, like I said, I'm 30 years old. I've made it this far somehow with that. And it's worked. If it ain't broke, you know. It's going to work till it doesn't work anymore. That's literally everything in life, though. Everything works until it doesn't work anymore, though. There is there is nothing that goes against that logic. Everything works until it doesn't work anymore. Like, I mean, you buy a new TV. It works. It's fine. And then one day, it stopped working. Shit, what happened? Man, it just stopped working. It worked just yesterday. Yeah, that was yesterday. Now, today, it doesn't. Like, everything works until it doesn't work anymore. This is working. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear the your day will come in your voice. I hear it. <laughs> maybe maybe it won't. Maybe I'll never get to that explosion. You know, maybe no one will ever scuff my sneakers. <laughs> you don't seem hopeful. I don't know because Different things happen to different people, so you're right. Maybe it won't ever happen. Maybe it won't ever explode. Maybe who knows? Maybe I'll somehow make it through, right? Um, yeah, I'm just telling you from experience because right. I've never heard, I don't think I've ever heard of a story where somebody suppressed something for so long and they turned out to be okay in the end. No, something always happened. You're still young. What's the rule? You're still young. <sighs> okay, relatively so, yes. Relatively so, I am still very much young. But like I said, I've made it 30 years. That's longer than a lot of people. I've somehow managed to hold it together for so long. I just need a couple more. And by a couple more, I mean like, like 30, like another 30 more. That's it. I just have to double what I have now. That's it, y'all. And if anything, remember midlife crises. I'm expected. I'm expected for that shit to happen. Oh shit! That means if sixty is it, I'm 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 right on time for my midlife crisis. <laughs> I'm like right on time. Shit. Okay. Well, you know what? Midlife crisis. Still, I wonder what my midlife crisis would look like. I used I'm not to trying to think about it, but I, I'm not about that life anymore. Hmm? I'm not trying to think about it. My midlife crisis. Okay, back on the serious note. <laughs> See, this is this is this is what I do. Though it's how I am. I deflect. I use humor. This is this is 
this is this is how I cope. It really is how I cope. Humor, deflection, like it's easier than having to deal with the actual problem. And you know what? Some problem there are some problems that need to be dealt with. I do accept that. But you know what? If I feel like I get away with not having to deal with that problem, because there are just so many of them, like just there's some shit that I just wish I could forget. There's some shit that, you know, just, I don't have to deal with it. If I don't have to deal with it, I don't want to deal with it. That's that's just my logic with it, point blank period. I mean, I have no better way of stating it. I have no better reasoning than, look, I dealt with it at that time, sort of. I went, no, I went through it at that time. If I decided to bury it, it stayed buried, and it will. I, if it feels like it's coming up, then we'll just put some more dirt on that shit and just keep moving. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> I'm listening. Okay, let's move on to male fragility real quick. We can end <laughs> that. <laughs> Because <laughs> that is something okay. that I mentioned also. Yeah. Um, we got to do better, y'all. We we got to do better. I mean, I can say this as a dude. I mean, just we got to do better. Um, let's 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 take it along the lines of. I mean, there's just so many things. Let's, let's take entanglements. It's the most recent, it's the most common. Everyone here is going to know what an entanglement is at this point. If not, you've, you've probably heard the word. Um, you know, let's, there's, there's a bunch of ways. Okay, there's a couple of things we can look at. Let's look at it from August's point of view. Shit has been four years. Now, like I said, there are many ways you can look at it. You can look at it from the point of view that he loved her so much, he still can't get over her and whatnot, da 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 But to be honest, any way you look at it, it's it's petty as hell. <laughs> Four years later for you to be bringing this shit up now. That is petty. And, you know, you're causing strife and you're causing problems in a relationship and a marriage. Now. Even if this is something that the couple, like, regardless of whatever the situation, let's just say, let's take it out of the context of, Will, Jada, and August. Let's just say this was a random couple, random street nobody cared about. It wouldn't get as much stuff. Because shit like this happens regularly. Because in time, that's another name for... And we you can discuss it, how, say how you want, but side pieces, situationships, um, whatever, like... It's just a new name for the same old thing. At the end of the day, August is causing problems in the relationship. He came in... You know, based on, you know, his, however he felt emotionally or um, mostly emotionally, this was a fully emotional move because logic dictates that you should not be doing this after four years. You know, maybe I would have accepted a couple of months after, I would have accepted up to a year, maybe two, but four years later of you, of silence of this not being a thing and then out of nowhere, you kind of just drop it. You know, that's something. Um, and he was... You also got a factor in the fact that he was sick too and right. we don't know how long that lasted he was sick and you know when you're sick and you got all of this stuff like weighing heavily on you you're more so concerning yourself with your illness than you are anything else now i think that because he's better now and he's put I'll be honest you, i feel like jada preyed on him to some extent but i feel like that's what a lot of people feel because they said if if, if the shoe was on the other foot and it was will and some you know young yes. thing or whatever he would have been villainized. And he would have. Many a, people would have vilified him completely. That's a word? Villainized? Vilified. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah, but he would have been painted to be the villain pretty much yeah. or whatever. But I don't really see anybody praising Jada. I see people like making fun of oh, the I situation. Am. Because I'm not, I mean, they make a joke of it. I'm not praising her because at the same time, August wasn't i don't want to say it was i'm not gonna say it was a wasn't a manipulative situation 
um, and there wasn't some stuff, but I completely accept that he probably also took advantage of Jada. Jada also had her whatever situation, huh? No, I'm saying, of course, they would take, they were using each other. Right, like Jada just got out of her situation with Will. She was feeling vulnerable as well. She said it herself. She, in the in the talk, you know, without getting too in, involved in that, but, you know, she liked the attention that he was giving her. So they both were using each other to fill that hole, that need, that that want within themselves. So Jada was using August to feel good, and August was using Jada for maybe his hole was a bit bigger or deeper or whatever, and these words just sound so wrong saying it out <laughs> now. <laughs> but I know what you mean. Whatever it was that he needed might have been, was different from what Jada needed. What he needed, what he wanted, what he expected out of this might have been, it, it was deeper, more, more so. And, you know, unfortunately, the way it ended, just it never sat right with him. But four years later, and this is, and I bring, I bring this up because it is a mental health thing and the fact that four years later for you to still, I don't want to say be pining, but it feels like you're still after her. And then after, you know, she says what they said, what they said about how, you know, basically their relationship is fine and this is how it had happened. Then you go and you drop a song about it. Like, bro, if anyone needs to talk to somebody right now, it's you. Like, you need to talk to somebody about this. You need to, I don't want to say get over it, because <laughs> we said that's not the greatest of terminology right now. But after four years, you need to have found a way to have accepted this. The fact that you're doing this shows that you haven't accepted any of it. And that's because it was never a clear understanding of what they were going to do after the fact. But I mean, if she's a married woman, what more do you expect? After four years. And it's not like... I could understand maybe if you dropped this when it looked like they were going through another rocky patch and they were looking... They're looking really good right now. You drop this while there's with there's no public reason to look like there's anything wrong with them. So what what was this for? So it's it sounds like you need to talk to somebody and help you accept this and help get your way through this. Now, from the will perspective, in terms of him, um, I've been told this not personally, but I've heard this and I've seen it. Us as men can't take what we dish out. <laughs> you know, um, we. Ooh, male masculinity is very fragile. I, I, I that I, I will accept. I do know. Um, and although no one has ever said this to me personally, I do know it's a thing. Um, I can give some of my own uh, reference pieces here. For example, yeah, all know I'm trying to be a hoe, right? Like. This is this is common knowledge. I, w I want to be a hoe. I wish I was the hoe. I wish I was the hoe y'all all thought I was, right? Now, let's just say I had like whew, five women. Ooh, amazing. Matter of fact, let's just say three. Let's not even push. Let's say I had three women actively, openly, everyone's aware of each other. There's no lies, there's no secrets. And I'm just doing my thing and they're all aware of this, right? I get it. I know I have three. Now, let's say of those three, I have a favorite. Now, the favorite has been single and she's been whatever all this time, you know, but, you know, she's the favorite because anytime I call or she does that, she does that one trick. That's just like, wow. But whatever. She's the favorite for whatever reason. Now, one day the favorite goes and she gets herself one other dude, not even in a full relationship. Just she's like, oh, it's just having a lot of fun. I want what he got. And she goes and she goes gets another dude. Because remember, even though she's a favorite, she's still the favorite amongst three. I'm just her one. So now she's like, okay, well, I'm going to get me another one. So the days if I hit him up and he's busy, at least now I have something else to go to. I'm going to feel a type of way. <laughs> like, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. But now it is. if I call her and I'm like, hey, what's up? And she's like, oh, I'm with such and such. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I'm not going to say nothing, but I'm going to feel a type of way. Like, who's that nigga? Like, why? Right? Like, we, what we had before was good, but you have to understand, and I know this, and this is why I'm like, I get it, and it's a, it's a perspective thing. It's very selfish. You're going to say what we had before was good, but the truth is what you had before was good for self. It was good for you as in the guy. Like, of course, you know, you want her at the chance, and you get her when you want her. It's perfect. She's, you know, you move on to the next or whatnot. 
but now she's working on doing what's good for herself. So now you feel threatened by that. And like I said, I've heard this many a time. There's no reason. We have a whole three. I had in this scenario a whole three women. She still right. she went and she just went and got herself one other dude on the side or one well now she has two me and another person. But she just went and got herself one other person. She's not stopping fucking with you. It's the same thing. It's just that I don't even know the rationale behind that. But you know, you hear this and all as a guy, like you're just like you know I've how seen, all the hairs on his back just stand yeah. up and whatnot. Like <laughs> I've seen things, okay, like two examples I could give is I've seen stuff where, you know, people make it a joke, but I think there's, you know, by, behind a lot of jokes is a lot of truth. So I've seen oh, yeah, there's, like, every, there's always a little bit of seriousness in every I'm, Yeah. And that's what makes it funny because it's relatable. So I I've seen like I saw somebody post recently, it was a joke or oh, whatever but you know i know it's some truth to it maybe it was a joke in his sense but you know whoever originally said it it wasn't a joke or it, it was a joke like ha ha but yeah deep down inside you know so right. it was it was a status that said oh women please stop cheating back we're not as strong as you so when that i was true that, yeah, when I read that, I purposely commented the Bugs Bunny gift of him saying no. Because, <laughs> because I'm like, you know, y'all cheat. Like, it's a difference in why women cheat versus why men cheat. Yes, and, and that's the thing, though. We know that. Yeah. We will, I think with women, we'll give a bunch of hints and we'll express how we feel before we go out and cheat. Men don't just cheat because it's Wednesday and she she had on a sundress and her ass was jiggling. <laughs> I just want to say black men don't cheat, but carry on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> black men don't cheat. Continue. We had this conversation last year, but all right. What? You heard me. <laughs> We had this conversation last year, but okay. Black men don't cheat. Black men don't cheat. It's a myth. This is made up in our minds. They don't cheat. Okay. So, you know, my thing is, yeah, y'all can dish it, but y'all can't take it. Um, they post, you said there's another funny one where it's like, um, a guy will cheat a hundred times and let her go cheat once. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, he will go out and be slinging his thing to everything in town and the minute she go out and she mess with one guy his heart broken he getting he listening to carl thomas songs and he, he listen just all eating kinds ice cream of things. Out the carton. He, he, eating ice cream out the carton drooling and snot everything it's ridiculous it's ridiculous but it's it's funny to me because it's like okay, okay. So when y'all do it, we're just expected to just hold it down. We're expected to man up. We're not. We we can't be angry or we're angry black women. We can't be upset or we're crazy. So like that's what we got to deal with in that sense. Another example is the show she's got to have it, where she openly had three entanglements, okay? But they accepted that. They accepted it. They definitely did, but it, it took a while because I, I think one of them had like a little bit of an issue with it. And um, the, I think I it was, I think it was the married guy. Well, to some extent, they all wanted to be the one though. That's what it was. Right. They all wanted to be the one. Like what's- I think Mars- I think Mars, Mars, was Mars liked her. Like he and he yeah. heard this though. He was like, yo, I like you, like you, like. Right. I think him and Overstreet were the ones that was a little, you know, or whatever. The other guy was just into himself, really. Right. But Greer. he just wanted to possess her though. Like that's that's I feel like that's the vibe he was giving off. Like, like he, she was his trophy or something. Right. He just wanted to have her. Like, you know, just so right. he, I have you. Overstreet. But like, 
I, honestly, I don't know what Overstreet's deal really was, but like Overstreet had a lot of nerve because you're a whole married man, right? So, and, like we said, look, he was doing all of this, and the moment she goes and she gets a dude, he, he went and got her dude beat up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she got yeah. Her jumped and robbed and shit. Like, oh, that's funny. Yeah, and it is like even it's like. And there's nothing wrong with men being fragile. It's nothing wrong with y'all having insecurities, but y'all got to do better in dealing with it because... Well, that's the thing. We've never been told how to deal with it properly, so we overcompensate. And it's unfortunate, which is why we're having this conversation, because there needs to be a healthy way, which is my whole point, not necessarily... Even if the next nigga ain't healthy? Because you said as long as... No! But you said get it out. I'm getting it out. Like, no. Hey, if you beat up the beat next up. person, if you beat up the next person and that person press charges, guess where your ass going? Right. That's how you got to do it, how Overstreet did it. That's what I was about to say. I'm not I'm not a fighter. I'm, I'm going to be honest. But you do know that, okay, that was a show. So Overstreet, I don't think he suffered any consequences from that. So he you got to think, that's TV. In real life, it's going to link back to you at some point. It is. You got, if you know people, and uh, if, I'm, I, mm, you know what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You could know people, but you know people only stay solid for so long. When they get, when they, when they backed against the wall, and that pressure is on, they singing like canaries. You're right. You're right. So yeah, like I just, I'm not saying. That men cannot be fragile. I'm not saying that men can't be insecure because I know y'all can. It's just that I see it a lot, especially on Facebook. Oh my God, on Facebook. I see it every see single the, day. The problem is we are fragile. Like it, it's just, it is that you are. Always being told that you have to be strong. There has to be a moment when you're fragile. The problem is there's there's two there's two separate ways that would happen. Last year, when I had my situation, the one that I told you about, the one that I don't feel like I'm not gonna share now. I'm sorry, y'all. But it was really, it was really difficult for me, and I had to be strong and I had to be whatever. Literally, I would cry, and there were only two times when I would cry. I cried in the car by myself when I was on the way to work, and I cried right before I would go to sleep. Now. I'm not going to say this was like an everyday thing, but it was an occurrence at those moments when I just couldn't, when I knew I was by myself, I would cry because I knew nobody would see me. I nobody would see my moment of weakness because that is what we were taught crying is. It's a moment of weakness. And I would, I'm not going to say I would cry myself to sleep, but I would just, it would get to that point where I would let myself feel whatever it is that I was feeling because not to cry i had to not feel it like that is what i had to do it's kind of like i had to put up this wall so to say and like all these attacks are coming and they're 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 beating up against the wall and then at night or on the way to work or whenever to not get overwhelmed i would have to let the wall down and let myself feel and i would cry mostly the car thing only happened like maybe twice once intentionally like i went i sat in the car and i cried and another time, like, it kind of hit me when I wasn't expecting it because I was just thinking about it too much. But mostly it would be in bed, days done. I'm not expecting anybody to walk into the room. You're just laying there and you're processing, and then it's like you're crying. Now, that's regular. Most dudes are probably going to say they don't even do that, so you know that's fine. Now, the other type of fragility is it's not seen as fragility, but we know what it is. It is the overcompensation of such to hide the fact that you're being insecure or that you are fragile. The the bravado, let's say, that is what bravado is. You know, when somebody, this is why it comes up, um, people with huge cars, like overly big cars, what do people say about them? They're overcompensating for something. And we all, maybe you, if you don't know, look up the, <laughs> look it up, but everybody knows pretty much what they're overcompensating for. The bravado itself is very similar to this. You acting extra tough or extra manly 
it's to hide the fact that right at that moment you're feeling insecure or whatever it is. So it is very visible for our fragility and our vulnerability and for whatever it is. And just because you think you're masking it in a different way doesn't mean that people don't see. We all know. Like, if you're a regular person or if you talk this type of way and suddenly it's like, nah, da 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 and you're suddenly like extra, then I know that's not you. And like we said, male ma- male fragility, male masculinity, the fragility of the male masculine right now. There's so many ways that like we just we, we know what it is. Women know what it is. Everybody knows what it is now. And online, all this extra stuff, all this overcompensation, all the bravado. It it we know it's just everyone knows it's just the way of for not everyone because there's some people who actually don't think that it is. But a lot of most people are catching on to the fact that's just the way of you masking that moment of you feeling like really low. Because that's all it is. Right. I've seen it in the past three years. I've seen way too many examples of like male fragility. I've seen I've seen men just 100% disrespect women. I've seen men who feel like um, it's okay to like be manipulative and take advantage of like this woman, this woman, that woman, and all of that. I've I've been at the epicenter of it, and it's in those moments where I've decided I'm nobody's option. I'm a priority. That's when they that's when they have a problem with it. Like, oh, how dare you move on with your life? What you thought I was supposed to do? So it's, you know, it, it men seem to have a problem with women who who have, like, gained some type of self-respect. Like, that's an issue. Because we we had enough. So if we decide when enough is enough and you decide, no, enough is not enough. I want to come back and play. It's an issue. Now I'm a bitch. Now I'm a hoe. Now I'm a slut. Now I'm trash. Now I'm this. So it's like, it's, it's not really fair. And I just really want, I just really want men to work on that. Cause I feel like that's the reason why we got this black women versus black men thing and that's why black women don't feel protected by black men i mean i'm not necessarily one of those that don't feel protected by black men i feel very protected luckily for me i've grown up with a good handful of black men who made sure i knew what being a young lady was my uncle was one of them my brother was one of them And then I have a lot of male friends, including you, but I have a lot of like masculinity around me that I feel protected and I make sure I protect black men. This is what I was saying earlier. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I accept it happens. I know it happens. I've seen it happen. Not in my own personal life though, but I do feel like, you know, the whole black woman not being protected by black men thing is another thing where it's like, it's a section of it, you know, like this is the whole, there's a section of it where it happens. It shouldn't happen and it shouldn't be a thing at all, but there is a part of it of this that happens and that's what's being focused on and it's being blown out of proportion. Let's be honest, most of us, like you said, have the type of light that you had, you know, and I'm not saying there aren't people, there are definitely other people who say they have otherwise and I, I accept that and I know it's there, but I feel like the majority of women are going to say they have brothers, fathers, uncles for the most part. And those people treated them, treated them well, you know, maybe not great, but they treated them well or whatever, a, a standard of whatever we're accepting. There was a standard to it of, you know, them being protected and being whatever. I feel like, you know, the whole black men don't protect their black women. It exists. There are black men who aren't whatever. But these are people who are in the eye of the things. These are like celebrities that y'all are using as examples. These are things that you see in media. How many people can actually say, oh, I know a friend who doesn't like black women? Yes, you know that, but you know, and it's funny you say this. I was thinking about this morning. Nobody says anything. Um, I saw something that was um, that read, oh, 
you never hear white men say they don't like white women or white people say they don't like this. And I'm like, yeah, you do. They just don't say, I don't like white women. White women, you can, if I, I, you know, approach an Asian woman, oh no, I only date white men. That's her saying, you know, she doesn't like Asian men. She didn't say, I don't like Asian men, but if she says, I only date white dudes, she's telling you, I don't like Asian men because she prefers white dude. The word it's is a yeah. it's the same thing. If I go to a white woman and she's like, oh, hey, chocolate, well, you know, how you doing? I only date black men. That's another way of her saying, I don't like white men. You know, it could be fetishist, it could be a kink or whatever, but either way, at the end of the day, her saying she only dates black men or anybody of color is, a, is another way of her saying, I don't like white men. It happens, <laughs> but people don't take the time to really think about it. Like, they're just like, oh, you'll never hear a white woman say she doesn't like white men. It happens all the time. If they date anyone else and say, oh, I prefer this or this is what I like, that's another way of saying I don't like white men or I don't like whatever it is that I'm dating. If they say, like I said, the Asian woman, I only date white men. She doesn't like Asian men because she just told you she'd prefer to date a white man. It's the right. same thing. And that's why I'm like, you know, I feel like sometimes it does, you know, people will focus on the negative and then blow it up. Not to say the negative doesn't exist. Not to say the negative isn't a problem. It's there. It should be recognized. We should think it. But don't take the negative and make it the majority of what it is because that's not the case. How many people who say, oh, black men don't protect black women in their personal lives themselves can say they've never been protected by a black man? And once again, I'm not saying that people who say this can't, don't have personal experiences, but I'm saying a lot of women are saying this are basing their, this sentiment off of what they've seen in the media, but in their own personal lives probably have brothers and cousins who they look up to and who they, who have had, who they've never had a problem with. I I honestly, I, I can't, I can and I can't relate. Because like I said, I've been in situations where I didn't feel protected by a black man. And I've also been in situations where I felt protected by a black man. It's just, it's, for me, it's different. And I can, right. see, I can see where people don't feel protected by black men in certain situations. Prime example, the whole Meg Thee Stallion, Tory Lanez thing. I can see where she doesn't feel protected because you have people making fun of her and blaming her as the reason why she got shot. And I'm like, She's not the one that pulled the trigger on herself. Okay, but what's the real... See, that whole thing, this is why I like... What's the, the story I heard, or the last one that I saw, is apparently... I didn't know she was so tall. She's like six feet, right? The police report said... And I didn't know he was this short. Tory Lanez is like 5'3". Now, I heard... And this is, and this is just, you know... Here, it's all hearsay because I don't know what of it is true. Nobody knows the full story. We just right. finding out bits and pieces. But what what the, what the current story is? I don't know if it's the current story, but the last part that I read was she was attacking him. She attacked him, and witnesses are stating that yes, they saw her attacking him. Now, I'm not for hitting on a woman, gentlemen. I'm not for. It. However, I also don't believe this means that as a man. You should ever let a woman beat on you for no reason. Now, I don't know where the whole gun thing came from, but if he really feared for his life, I don't think it was that bad, though. I didn't see the mugshots, but he doesn't look that beat up. But he's a tiny dude, you know, if he's fragile, if he's whatever. Let's be honest, y'all, we live in an age where many people are more like, are, are quicker to pull the trigger than they are to actually fight. So, you know, unfortunately, that's what it is. But if he really feared for his life, if that story is true, I don't feel like you can say black men don't protect black women if she was the one attacking him. Because if, if it wasn't Meg Thee Stallion, let's take the very same exact situation and we put another six foot dude, even with the same exact frame that Meg has, he might've been a little skinnier and lanky, but he's six foot fighting this five foot three dude. And he ran up on him. And then you heard Tory Lanez pull out the gun and shot him in the leg. You'd be like, you know, Tory was just defending himself. Nobody would question it. So I'm not looking at gender. Gender always, of course, plays part into sex, plays part into this. But in this, if he felt, if this, if this story is real, like I said, I don't know how much truth there is to it, but if Meg Thee Stallion was attacking him, um, I think they said because she was upset. They're dating? Were they dating? I don't know. Like Supposedly they're dating, 
but they both their reps wanted them to keep it on the hush because of you know image you know how it right. is when you so they're with, dating so they're what? dating and he was flirting because remember kylie with Jenner that kardashian there. girl yeah he was supposedly flirting or all over her while meg the stallion was there supposedly allegedly meg was drunk and she started attacking him I don't know how it got from her attacking him to the part in the party to they're in the car now and she's trying to get out and he shot her in the foot. That's okay, the part. See, that I didn't even know about that. That's foggy to me. Right. And I'm not saying that he deserves to be attacked because I don't condone anybody putting their hands on anybody. I don't care if you're right. a male hitting a female, a female hitting a male, a child hitting a child. I don't do the personal space thing. And I tell people that all the time. Once you violate my personal space, that's that's all grounds for me to knock you out. Right. That's how I feel because you're violating my personal space. Like I, everybody has a box. Unless I invite you into that box, don't violate my space. So if she was attacking him and putting her hands on him or whatever, okay, I can understand that. But I don't feel like that's a reason that that's that's a good enough reason for him to shoot her. It's something deeper than that. Yeah, it's something deeper than that. Like you said if it it's was attacking him in the party, and then it stopped, and then they got into the car. See, now that doesn't. Right. And then, and then the me, thing I thought is, she was she attacking was him out of the car. She okay. was getting out of the car when he shot her foot. That's okay, what I. Yeah, was. that don't make sense. And no. see, at right. first when I heard the story, they were saying she cut her foot on glass. They never said. All they said was that they heard gunshots, and Tory Lanez was responsible for it. Later on, Meg Thee Stallion said, "No, I was shot, and I'm traumatized, and because she was shot." People started making fun of her or whatever. And I didn't think it was funny. That's why I said what I said. And, you know, I see a lot of guys defending Tori like, well, he's 5'3 and she's six foot. Okay, that's fine. And if she attacked him, she's wrong too. Most most definitely. Right. I'm not saying she's not wrong in attacking him, but I don't think that's I don't think that warrants you getting shot. Like I said, we 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 stated this as a very fragile thing. Now yeah. The way you explained it, no. If it was a fight in the party and then y'all got to the car and she's getting out the car, no, the shooting doesn't make sense. Now, right. if it was her getting shot while her attacking him, I'm I'm not gonna say it's fair, but it's it's what happens. If the fact that he has a gun shows that he already feels like, you know, that's the only way he can defend himself. A lot of people were saying it was premeditated. Because why would you have a gun? at a party of all places you know so well, black people carry guns and it's not the smartest of things i mean yeah but if you're going to a party it was at a club you know no i think it was like a house party or something that's what it looked like it was a house party it was at somebody's house i don't know then because <laughs> i don't feel the need to carry weapons to be to a party that i know somebody who's throwing it i'll, I'll carry a weapon well, not a weapon, but like, you know, maybe like a little mace or something if I'm walking the streets or whatever by myself because, right. yeah, but not know if I'm in a car and I'm like, you know, okay, well, I'm going to carry my gun because you never know who's going to act stupid at this party. Like, that's kind of odd. Well, to that me. is how people think. I mean, yeah, but before you do all of that, Pete, and that's the thing, people need to stop with the pew pews and y'all need to use your fists and stop being punks. And y'all need to take it back to old school when you used to have them fights. Shoot the, the, the fair outside, right. You yeah. Just, yeah, and that's you know, the even era if you I lose, I don't know about this 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 gun business, but even if you lose, at least then the both of y'all could walk away from the situation. People don't shoot fairs no more. They what? don't. I, I, I'm gonna shoot the fair one person. We we gonna fight outside. We we gonna get the Vaseline, the sneakers, and all of that, and we gonna shoot the fair one outside. That's no, me. I'm, 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 I'm gonna let's, I'm gonna let's talk this out. You know, this is, oh, no, all right, then you go your way. I'm gonna go my. Nah, way. see me. I'll talk it out. But if I didn't talk it out till I'm blue in the face and you done pissed me off enough, we gotta fight. Now we no, gotta. I don't fight. see. I don't get to that point. Just you know what? Go. I, I try not to get to that point, but people, people are dumb. Shoot. I'm sorry. People are just dumb overall, and I can't deal with too much stupidity. I'm just. You got it. You know what? Even though I think what you're saying is dumb, the conversation we had right before this, like, you know what? You got it. Yeah. Right. Like, sometimes yeah, and that instance, you have to it's not worth it. In that instance, it's not worth it. But for me, it, it has to be it has to be something. Like, because I'm I'm pretty chill until I'm not. 
and I'm <laughs> and people try me and then once I get up here that's why I try not to get angry because when I get angry I black and once I black I'm no longer I'm no longer in I don't I don't nice me is gone right there's no <laughs> there's no talking me off the ledge all my logic go out the window and I'm just I want to fight that's it Okay, but to bring it back to, you know, your point about black men not protecting black women and this Meg the Stallion thing. Um, yes, I'm not saying I agree to it, but this is what I'm saying where, you know, something like this happens, you know, this one situation right here will happen and it will be what people focus on. And this is going to be the example used and this is going to be the the front and center situation first oh well yeah this is another way of why black men don't protect the black woman this one situation right here does not you know this is the exception not the exception to the rule that is now becoming the rule like, and i feel like that's what people are doing when there's plenty of other situations where of black men protecting black women that don't get as much talk as this like you know let's um in passing i'm, I'm sorry I, i've seen this is another thing like you know the thing with the human mind is we focus on a lot more negative things than we do with positive stuff. But there was a dude who took a bullet for somebody. I don't know much of the story, but I think I heard something like that. A man who was protecting a group of women, I think, jumped in front of a bullet to try to save him or something. You know, like there are, there are stories out there of men going above and beyond the same way you're going to find stories of eight shit ass people doing eight shit ass shit. You know, but everybody is going to, they're going to, they're gonna hold the, the the ball headed whole shit, <laughs> the ball headed ratchet shit, and they're gonna like this is what it is, and then they're gonna like blow it up, and it's gonna seem like this is the entirety of it, when in reality it's just such a small portion compared to everything else that is actually going on. Also, on the same hand, I'm not saying everybody should focus on just the good and be like, oh my gosh, all black men are taking bullets for women, black women. No, that's not the case either. On average, it's just an average thing. They treat them, you know, accordingly, or they treat them with respect, or they treat them as women. They don't do, they, they're neither good nor bad. It's just an average interaction. Mm -hmm. That is the average, I would say. And then on, that's, that's the majority of it. And on either end of the spectrum, there's the really people who are doing exceedingly well, and then people who are doing exceedingly bad. But I just feel like, you know what, everyone's stuck on the exceedingly bad, and they're trying to make that the whole thing. Right. So, black men, you know, um, my my last word to y'all today, or my last couple of words would be, we've stopped cheating. We don't cheat anymore. That was something that we used to do in the past. We're now better. We don't cheat anymore. On that same accord, we just... <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the way she's looking at me. <laughs> okay, let me reset. We don't cheat anymore. We have done better in that accord. Let's do better in everything. Let us, and it sucks um, that, you know, I'm gonna say this and it's, it's a crappy line, but it's a great line of the same thing. Um, I say it's a crappy line for how it, um, for the reality of it. You know, we have to work twice as hard just to get half as much as the regular people. So just to be respected, just to show people that we have respect just average respect we have to always seem to be going above and beyond or else people are going to look at us and be like we don't respect our women when that is not the case when like i said we can be doing the same exact stuff asian men are doing and white men are doing and everybody else are doing but because it's us because we look like this it is not acceptable yeah you're called thirsty huh you're called thirsty so what we have to do why does the light keep doing that? Why does it get like? Do you, do you... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I see it too, but okay. I'm like, it gets brighter at certain parts, like you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, <laughs> I got distracted for a second. I'm sorry, but we have to do better overall. I know we can. It's it's not that hard. We are trying. We are working on it. We'll continue to do so. Like I said, we don't cheat right now. Let's get another win under our belt. Let's move forward. Let's let's get these W's, y'all. We got this. <sighs> oh, and also, um, this was supposed to be a whole mental health thing. 
Um, find your outlet. Uh, I was saying earlier, I'm not the type to talk to anybody, but then she said there are many ways. I write. My art, I do not draw, I write. My outlet would definitely be in my comic. Um, I, the last chapter I actually put out, it was very, uh, very close to the situation with what was going on with me. And I don't know if you read the chapter yet, see if you've seen it, but a lot of people told me it was a very touching chapter. It was very difficult for me to write. My mom was, I'm not, okay, it was it dealt with the mom. And the person in the chapter is dealing with something with their mom as well. And I'm not gonna lie, I definitely use that as an outlet. And it was cathartic to me and it did help me some. So maybe I'm not gonna explode. Maybe that's why I'm so healthy. And you out here thinking that, you know, I'm I'm bottling everything up, but here I am putting it in my art already. So that's why I mean, that's why I'm getting through. I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought I was covering it all up. <laughs> Who knew? Right? Didn't I tell you I already cracked you? Wow. <laughs> oh, but you didn't crack me because you always told me to talk to somebody. We just now talked about getting other ways. So I figured it out with your help, though. With your help, definitely. With your help. You figured it out. What? Like I said, you crack me. You ain't I crack play, me. Damn it! I, I refuse. Did I, did I, did put, I not? Did I'm I? Did I not? Name my art then. <laughs> did I? Or did I not plant the seed though? So you know, um, I planted the seed. Find. <laughs> yes. Okay, people. She cracked me. So if you need help, definitely message her. Like on some real shit though. If you just need to talk, I'm sure she would take the time out to hear what it is that you have to say. But seriously, find your outlet. Um, I didn't know until she mentioned it. And when she said it, I was like, I've definitely used this platform, like us talking. I've used my other platforms. I've used my art. And I have gotten these certain things off my chest. I have been able to discuss certain things that even if I'm not talking to them with another person, I feel like I'm sharing them with you. And in a way that is very helpful. So yes, she did crack me. Kudos to you, Zs. She did assist me without me even knowing. Um, but find what works for you. Find that way because everybody is different. I'm not comfortable laying down on somebody's couch and telling them the stuff that goes on with me. I'm not saying that I would never be comfortable, but just the thought of it, like it seems too personal. I don't even like telling my friends shit. Like, how can I tell it? I mean, it's easier to tell a stranger stuff, but it's like, I've told strangers shit about me all the time, you know, but it's difficult to come to a stranger knowing that you're supposed to tell them these things. That's not me. I can't do it. At least in my, right now in this stage, I can't do it. But find something that does work for you. Like I said, apparently my platforms have helped me speaking on Many of things with y'all. I have let y'all in on many facets of my life. Y'all know, even if may, maybe not specifics, you know some very generalized but very important stuff about me. You've known, I really, you know about my relationship with my mom. I brought her up many times, many times in this conversation alone. Y'all know things. And in my comic, I brought something up recently. And just, you know, teach talking about it allowed me to realize that, yes, I am getting it out there. And even though I didn't know, it is very, it is very soothing. It, it does help. It is a way to let it out. It's a way to let the pressure off. So this is what this is what's keeping me from exploding, teeth. This you, all of this is what's keeping me from exploding. But at the end of the day, black men, black women, Asian, white, whoever you are who is listening to this today, take a moment of your day. Just Think on yourself for a second and then come to not a decision, but come to a realization of what it is that you need to do to help you. What am I looking for, Tease? To help, to just help you. Express yourself. Express yourself. What is it, what is it that you need to do? Do you need to paint? Do you need to draw? Do you need to write, sing, work out? Just what is your outlet? Just take a second to figure out what that is. And that's all I have. That's a good note to end on. <laughs> that's a good note to end on. Okay. And we say it every Friday. 
or whatever I will handle. So make sure you guys check out his webtoon, um, Light in the Dark comic. Yes, Jatice will drop a, a link. Everything will be a uh, link to the Facebook page, link to the Instagram. Everything will be in the description below, of course. And um, y'all already know me. <laughs> y'all know how to reach me. Or whatever, because I don't really, I don't, I don't drop my handle on mental health Mondays or whatever. I save that for fishbowl or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, y'all, y'all know how, y'all know how to reach me or whatever. If, if ever you need somebody to talk to, if you're comfortable talking to somebody, confiding in somebody or whatever, I'm all ears. I'm a good shoulder. Got two of them for a reason. So yeah. And this was Mental Health Mondays. <laughs> this is a long one because usually my mental health are not long, but this was this was needed. It was needed. Okay. I like I felt like it was something that had to be talked about because I see it too. It's, it's, I see it every day, all day, and it's just nobody talks about it, and nobody wants to deal with it or whatever. And I'm just here to say it's okay. And black men, I got you. We don't cheat. <laughs>